Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Lifehouse. Good to see you in the room. Good to see you online. If you're here in the room, I want to invite you to stand, join us, and let's sing this morning. Come on. So good. You guys can have a seat. Again, thank you for joining us today. If you missed the welcome, my name is Ryan. So good to be with you in the room and online. And um, uh, we, we, we got a great day for all of us, we think. And uh, listen, if you're new, uh, if you're here in the building or online and you're new, we just, uh, man, we want to give you a special welcome. We are really glad that you decided to join us today. If it's your first time, we really hope it's not your last time. We hope you enjoy it and come back again next week. Uh, if I want to tell you, if you are new in the building or online, um, we would love to meet you. Um, we'd actually, we've got a gift for you, a uh, gift card. I tried to put on a disguise and go out there and get it, but they didn't let me. So, but if you're new, you can do that. 
Um, just as our way of saying thanks for being with us. So in the room, just head out to the, um, the guest services desk in the, in, the, in the lobby. After the service, if you're online, just click the link in the chat box, and we'll send that to you as our way, way of saying thanks. Um, we do have a great day for all of us. Uh, I do want you to know, whether you're new but, uh, or, or maybe you've been here for 15 years, if you're a, if you're a parent, if you have kids, or you're a caretaker, you're a grandparent, we just want you to know that, um, man, we care about the next generation so much. We want to invest in them, and so that your kids, if they're here right now, your students are here, they're having a great experience in those environments there, and we know that you care about your students, your kids, and uh, you want to invest in, the, in them as well. And so they're having a great experience now. Um, but we know parenting's hard. We know life can be challenging, and that's why we created this place for us to come and kind of let go of what's going on in our lives and, um, and have a great experience in this room today. So uh, we're going to be here for about 60 minutes or so, and uh, we are in the middle of our Be Rich season, which is our annual uh, kind of extravaganza of generosity. And so if you're new, you're, you're catching us at the best time. This is where you get to see us at our best. And so our lead pastor, Matt Brown, is going to walk us through that. The band's got a couple songs. And uh, again, we just want to create a time where you have the chance to connect with a heavenly father who loves you so much. Uh, but before we hop into the next song uh, here in the room, I want to invite you to stand and uh, turn to somebody next to you and say good morning. Tell them you're, uh, you're glad to see them, and then we'll get rolling with the rest of our service.
the story ends. So as we sing this next song, uh, maybe you're here and, um, you know, it's just been a while since you slowed down a little bit because life is crazy and we're all busy and there's a ton of stuff going on and our minds maybe are in different places. Maybe it's been a while since you have just taken a breath and um, we want to create some space right now in the next five minutes for you to slow down, take a breath and make some room for Jesus. Um, because we believe that Jesus loves each of us and wants to do something in and through us. So let's make room for Jesus this morning. Here is where I lay it down Every burden, every crown This is my surrender this is my surrender Here is where I lay it down Every lie and every doubt This is my surrender And I will make room for you To do whatever you want to To do whatever
thank you for your love. We thank you that you are always pursuing us, chasing after us, and help us to make room in our hearts and our lives for you. Um, we need you. Thank you for who you are and what you've done. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. 2007, the year Apple announced the iPhone. Bob Barker announced his retirement. Skinny jeans became our gene of choice, for better or for worse. Peyton Manning won his first Super Bowl, and Jordan Sparks was crowned American Idol. Gas peaked at $2.80 a gallon, and movies could be seen for only $6.88. Beyonce taught us we were irreplaceable. The Fray taught us how to save a life, and Ratatouille taught us that anyone can cook. And in 2007, a movement began in our church. A movement that started small and spread across the world. A movement that inspired us to share with our friends and neighbors, to step out in faith, to impact our communities. A movement that called us to give, to serve, to love, to make a difference. A movement that unleashed a wave of generosity and shared hope with everyone in its wake. And that same movement continues today. With each one of us, together, we can do more good than we can on our own. Together, we can continue to give, serve, and love our community. Together, we can be rich. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Matt, and I'm the lead pastor, and I am overwhelmed by all the faces I see in this place and online. So it's great to have you here, and you need to know, Ryan said this earlier, if you're new, this is such a good Sunday for you to be here because we're in our Be Rich season, which is where we lever up generosity around our church. We want to live this way all year long, but this is the season we lean in hard, and this is a season we stretch out to love, and we're going to talk about doing that in our community today, but I'm going to give my best illustration about Love Away right now. This weekend, we had a transit weekend, and if you're new, transit is our middle school environment. We had 70 middle schoolers go through a weekend with us, and it was overwhelmingly fun. They're in this room jumping up and down and dancing and spinning around and learning about God and trusting their lives with God. And at the same time, our band was here for hours and hours serving them. We had adults in the lobby, the 
cooking for them and feeding them and cleaning up after them. And the thing that just made such an impression on me is there were people that were a fair bit older than I, and I am not young anymore, that were spending the weekend serving middle schoolers. And they probably did not love the music or love all the energy or all the smoke in the room like right now. It's not usually this smoky, but you know, it's just what happens sometimes. And, but I just watched them love middle schoolers. And then at my house, um, we housed 14 eighth grade girls, just so you know. Um, and Paula and Ava, Paula, you know, works at the hospital. She's amazing. She just gave up a whole weekend to spend with her small group of girls and love them and cart them around. And I just like, it's amazing to see when people love each other. It just is. Now this morning, I left the house kind of early around six o'clock. And as I walked to the garage, all the girls had left their tennis shoes. So there are 14 pairs of tennis shoes. Um, and, you know, I'm an empty nester. So it's just my wife, Tina and I. And I just need you to know, that girl's feet smells bad as boys. Anyway, so there, there's the insight to that along the way. And here's why I tell you that, is we are learning and our students are learning to practice this thing that Jesus modeled over and over. And this was what he modeled, that everybody matters to God, whether God matters to them or not. And I tell you that because some of you showed up today or you're watching online and you're like, eh, God doesn't matter so much to me, but I'm interested or I'm looking for something. I just want you to know. No matter how much you like God or love God or dislike God, he cares about you and he loves you. And this was at the center of Jesus's message over and over and over. And that's why, especially in this season, but we try and do this all year round, we want to practice the idea of being rich. And if you missed last week, I'd love for you to go back and watch last week's message um, because I talked about generosity and I'll talk about what we're doing with generosity, how we're going to do something that supports students out of here. None of it goes here. We're going to support some students out of here. I'll get to that in just a few minutes. But you're rich. And some of you were like, I'm not rich, but here's what you need to know. If you ate breakfast this morning, if you have a place to live, if you have a car, if you have anything in that manner compared to the rest of the world, you're rich compared to most of the world. If your car has its own house, we call those garages, you're rich. And the Apostle Paul, who wrote so much of the New Testament, he said to this young pastor, um, Timothy, and this is where we get the idea of being rich, he said, Timothy, command those who are rich in this present world to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous, that's what we talked about last week, and willing to share. And one of our you know, goals is to learn how to be rich with our lives, basically because we already are rich because we were born in the United States of America, most of us, but someday you might be really rich, and when you get really rich, I want you to practice being rich when you don't have so much, so when you have more, you'll learn how to give some away. So that's what we talked about last week and sponsoring some kids, but again, we'll get back to that in a second. This week, I want to talk to you about good deeds, and good deeds are something for most of us that are not natural. And I will get way ahead of all of you. Um, I need to specifically think about this every year because good deeds are not natural for me. They just aren't. I'm not a natural. Let's go help that person. Let's extend ourselves. Let's give up our time. That's sacrifice. That is not normally me. But I have experienced that throughout my life. In fact, um, a couple weeks ago, um, I was standing on stage and I realized, actually it was before I ever got to church a couple Sundays ago, I'm like, I am, I, I'm sick. I feel really, really bad. And I was trying to figure out how not to speak that morning, but I didn't really have any options. And so I spoke, I got through the morning and I went home and I was sick, sick, sick. And I felt awful. Well, then the next morning um, I took a COVID test and I had COVID and for eight days I was out. And when I was out, my wife Tina had to do some business um, on a business trip with our staff. And so I was home alone. And, and there was a couple from our church that for a couple different evenings just said, hey, we want to bring you dinner. We want to bring you dinner. And you, look at me. I don't need more dinner. I know that. And you know that. But when you're hungry and you're sick, some soup really tastes good. And so they just made a special effort just to do a good deed for me and bless me. And here's why I tell you that. Because you, if you've ever received a good deed like that, you know how much it means. But the natural inclination for many of us is right now not to even be thinking about the good deed. You're trying to decide in your head if COVID's real or not, aren't you? Or what about the vaccine? And what about the government? And what about the conspiracies? Or it's going to kill us all, wherever you land on that. And here's what you need to know. I don't care what you believe about COVID or any of that. I just don't this morning. But I don't want you to miss good deeds over everything else that distracts us from good deeds. 
And 2,000 years ago, Jesus showed up on the planet when people thought God didn't care. And Jewish people were struggling with, we only have one God. Can he cover it all? Can we trust him? And when Jesus showed up on the planet, compassion, compassion was considered a weakness. I told you this last week. If you had compassion, you're just weak. If you were gentle, you're just a weak person. Instead, strength, wealth, and family name were valued above all. If you were strong and you had wealth and your name in the community meant something, or in a village or in a nation, people just thought, well, God must like you. God just must care about you. And this was also in a time 2,000 years ago where children were sold for just horrible reasons and discarded and killed if you didn't want your child anymore. And anybody, anybody could go from I'm a normal free person to a slave, no matter what your race was, your nationality, if you owed too much money, if you had too much debt, if someone was just stronger than you, people were treated like objects, especially women and children, and the world was so dark. As dark as it ever has been or ever will be until maybe Jesus comes back. Even darker than today. Just so you know, I say this all the time. If you have this sense that the world's never been as bad as it is right now, you are wrong about that. 2,000 years ago, there was darkness across the world that you cannot imagine. And then one day, John the Baptist, he's in the Jordan River. I love this story so much. And he's just baptizing people. He's getting ready for something bigger, and he looks up, he points at a dude in a robe and sandals, and he looks just like a normal human being, and he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he points to Jesus, and Jesus steps on the pages of history, and he loved in ridiculous ways, and he spent time with ridiculous, sinful people, and he taught things that made people's brains hurt. And then he gave his life on a cross for the forgiveness of sinners like me and sinners like you. And then he rose from the dead. And people like John, who wrote the Gospel of John, in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John spent time with Jesus. And then when they got a little bit older, they recorded and documented the life of Jesus. And John who was there with Jesus through almost all of it. He took care of Jesus' mama when she was old. I mean, can you imagine the stories that he got? from her mom, his mama, Jesus' mama. He sits down as an old man like, how, how can I write about my savior, my king, and my friend so the world will know who he was? And John writes in this little beautiful letter, 1 John, he says, he, Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And atoning means he's the one that de deals with, covers our sins. He is the one. This is the beauty of God, and here's the illustration. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And he goes on, and not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. And I'll remind you, if you know this, but if you don't know this, this is what we believe as followers of Jesus, that we all have a sin problem. I mean, it is the obstacle in our lives from God. When we don't do or shouldn't do or miss to do what we should do, according to God, and that's a problem. And we all have a sin problem. And Jesus showed up and he just said, I'll deal with your sin. I'll pay the price that you don't have to. And he leveled the playing field. And the reason John writes this and the way he writes it is, listen, he did this for me, John would say, but he also did it for the whole world. And he didn't do this while people would become Jewish and that's kind of where Jesus started with the Jewish people. He did this so people would know God and come close to God and have life with God. And this is what John would say. This is how confident I am. He would say, we know that we have come to know him. This is a personal thing. This isn't I showed up to church and I did a few things and I checked the box. This is like I could know God personally. And we know him if we keep his commands. Now this is a really important thought this morning because he says, listen, if we keep his commands, he is not talking about if we keep his commands, our sins are forgiven. The only way, maybe you've never heard this, so I need to slow down. The only way that John would say you can have your sins forgiven is by trusting that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. Because you will never do more good things than you do bad things. 
Your motives will never be right enough or perfect enough versus all of our wrong motives that swirl around in our head. We may never act on them, but you know those motives are, can be pretty ugly and pretty dark and pretty sinful. So we can only be forgiven and have eternal life because of Jesus and trusting him. But how you really know you know him is if you keep his commands. How you'd really tell if you're a follower is if you go, you know what, Jesus is my king, and you know this, this is common sense. And I'm gonna do what my king says because I know him personally. And this is this weird dynamic where Jesus is our friend and our king. Like when he walks in the room, we don't have to run away or be afraid of him because he loves us and he forgives us, but at the same time, he's a king. And you know what you say to your king when he tells you to do something? Yeah, yes, sir. And then you hug him and you call him your friend. It's a weird dynamic. And John leans in because this is a big thing for our culture and their culture. He says, whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar and the truth is not in that person. And John is not calling anyone to be perfect. But he is saying, if you say, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I'm a follower, but you just don't do what he says, just stop lying. Just stop being a hypocrite. Just stop lying to yourself and other people and just know that this is, this is the deal. And this is the way it works in church sometimes. Um, yeah, I know Jesus because I can quote these five scriptures and I can say these prayers and I can sing these songs and I showed up to church and so I'm a good Christian. And John would say, well, that's all good and you should do that. But there is so much more than just that. And then he leans in, he says, but if anyone obeys, and that's a word we do not like to talk about, especially in church these days. You, you, you mean I gotta do something? I gotta sacrifice something. I gotta lay down my will for God's will. And John would say, yeah, because remember, he, he's your friend, but he's your king at the same time. Love for God is truly made complete in him. If you obey, I mean, like the fullness of who God is is happening in your life. And this equation that obey equals love God is just a huge deal. And remember, John saw the resurrection. He saw the death of Jesus. He saw how Jesus loved people. And Jesus would say over and over, John, write this down. I'm the invisible God shown up on the planet Earth. If you want to know what God is, look right here. In fact, Jesus said, if you want to see the Father, look at me. Because we are one. This is fellowship with God. Back, back to this passage. But if anyone obeys his word. Next slide. Love for God is truly made complete in him. Next slide. There you go. This is how we know we are in him. So here's the setup. Listen, this is how we know. You can know whoever, whoever. Next slide. <laughs> Claims to live in him. This is huge. Must live as Jesus did. John, wait a minute. You, are you telling me that I have to live like, yeah, I'm telling you, you have to live like Jesus. I have to wear sandals? No, you don't have to wear sandals. That's not the point. That's stupid. You mean I have to go to the temple like Jesus went to the temple? No, because there is no more temple. I got to observe all the Jewish holidays? No, that is not the point. It's simpler than that. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all talk about this ethic when that Jesus showed up on the planet. He said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to love people like I love you. I want you to give to people like I've given to you, your friends and your enemies. John goes on and he says, I, dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. And when he says this old one, he doesn't mean like all the way back to Genesis. He meant since the beginning when Jesus showed up on the planet. And then he refers to the oldest command. He says this old, old command, this is tricky language, is the message that you have heard. He's talking to a Jewish audience predominantly. The guy that you grew up with over and over and then John gets a little poetic, hang in here with me because this is a little more confusing. He said, yet I'm writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you. And I love this. Because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Remember, John's an old man. He's in exile. He's seen the resurrection of his savior and he knows this Christian ethic of loving people like Jesus loved them is is starting to happen. And the sun is starting to rise in the horizon. 
and the darkness is being dispelled. It's been 40 years since Jesus rose from the dead and John is seeing it as this movement of Christianity is growing and multiplying and people are starting to believe and the darkness has been dispelled and the one ethic that is driving all this is that Jesus is your king and he loves you. Now love people the way Jesus loves you. And everything he taught you was to love him and love other people, even when the teaching is hard. Like, you shouldn't lie to someone. Why? Because God hates me? No, because when you lie to someone, it hurts them. So don't lie. Don't be dishonest. Be honest and truthful. And John levers up. Remember, he's an old man, and I feel this the older I get, you know, the less, like, you know, words I want to waste. He says, anyone who claims to be In the light, you know, enlightened, like I know who God is. Anyone who claims to be in the light, he goes on, but hates a brother or a sister is still in darkness. And this is the loophole Christianity that so many of us have been frustrated with in our lives. I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, but I won't talk to my neighbor. I'm a Christian, I'm like Jesus, I'm a, but I I won't ask for forgiveness. I won't say I'm sorry. Or I'll hold a grudge forever. I can pray and I go to church and John would say, yeah, you go to church. And you might even go to heaven because remember, you can be forgiven because of what Jesus did, but you're still like dwelling in darkness and you've given yourself permission to stay in darkness. And John just says, but, I love buts, but anyone who claims to be in the light and dismisses, rejects, considers unimportant, pushes to the periphery or mistreats someone else is still in the darkness. And that's actually out of the MBV version, which is the Mount Brown version. I I came up with this myself this morning because I wanted to contextualize what John was saying for us. If you dismiss, pause, who do you dismiss? If you reject, Think about the people you reject. You may never have meant them, but you've seen them on the news. You've read about them. Who who do you reject that you don't know or you do know? Anybody you consider unimportant or anybody you mistreat? And this is so interesting, not just physically, but in your heart or with your emotions online, on social media. I know you can quote some scripture. I know you got a small group of good Christian friends, which you should have both those things. I know you have 10 new worship songs on your Spotify list. But if you do this, you're missing a huge part of it. I experienced this a couple weeks ago. I went to California, and like many of us, I'm like, California, there's such a mess. Everybody's so confused. It's, everybody's leaving. There's poverty everywhere. And so I got on a plane, went to San Francisco waiting to see the foolishness of California because when you're in Northwest Ohio, it's just easy to think that way, isn't it? I mean, let's just be honest. And I got to California and I met some of the best people I've ever met in my life that love God and are raised in families. And I drove through some poverty-stricken areas and it was really weird. I mean, there was lots of poverty in San Francisco, but it just wasn't like, it just wasn't like it's portrayed And all of a sudden I went, see, somehow in my mind, because of what I've seen and I've heard people talk about, I've just dismissed a whole state. How stupid is that? How how foolish is that? There are God's people just, and I I am embarrassed to admit it in front of you because I'm, you know, an educated, hopefully halfway intelligent man. And all of a sudden I, I started to think like a child. Don't dismiss people, Jesus would say. Don't, don't reject people. Don't push them out of the way. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light. Whether they're in Van Wert County, across the country, or across the world. And there is nothing in them that makes them stumble. This is so beautiful. When you love the people that are hard to love, like your enemies, everything changes. But everyone, he would say. But everyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. You mistreat people God loves, 
God would say, you mistreat me. Now, I talked to you about transit weekend, and we had all these kids, 70 kids, and um, we had 14 middle school girls, eighth grade girls at our house, um, and I had a truckload of them that I took home, and met my daughter Meg spoke on this stage to them last night. She killed it, so proud of her. My son Josh spoke in the morning. I'm just bragging. My, so my son and my daughter both spoke yesterday, um, and uh, <laughs> Meg's boyfriend was with her last night. You've t- if you've been around here, I've talked about Meg's boyfriend a little bit. And so I got four eighth grade girls that we get in the car and they're immediately like, hey, Matt, what do you think about Meg's boyfriend? I mean, they were interested. And I'm like, you know what? I I really like him. And they asked this great question. Like, I I don't know why I didn't expect them to ask this, but it was a great question. What do you like about him? Isn't that a great question for an eighth grade girl to ask? What do you like about him? And my first answer is, well, The thing Meg and I have talked about her whole life, that anybody she'd connect her heart to would follow Jesus. You know why? Because I want whoever that is to love like Jesus. Because he'll be connected to my daughter. And then the second thing was... That, and I explained this to him, and you don't, you know, ask me a question, I'm just going to start preaching. Um, because Meg has decided to set some boundaries in her life um, when it comes to physicality and sexuality, and there's some things that she just knows that this is for married people. And I looked at the, or I was driving actually, but I got real quiet, and I said to these young ladies, here's what I know, this young man is deciding to respect her boundaries and walk alongside her with these boundaries. And I know that if he'll respect these now when it's hard and it's sacrifice, because it is, it's hard when you're a young man to respect a female sexually. That's a really good chance 10 years from now, if they would get married, they may not, but if they do, he'll love and honor her and respect her because he's shown he can do it. And he values the things that God values. And I don't want anybody to connect to my daughter that doesn't value her. And the girl's like, oh, that's good. Pro tip, dads. <laughs> you should have that conversation with your daughters along the way. Point being, you hurt my daughter, you hurt me. And I'm not okay with that. Your heavenly father would say, you hurt somebody I love and I created. I don't care how they vote. I don't care what skin color they are. I don't care what they identify as. I don't care what country they live in or what side they're on. They were created in my image and no one gets dismissed. And remember, this is a really important time as we see atrocities. And that's an important word today, atrocities. And I would agree, there's atrocities going on in our world. But 2,000 years ago when Jesus showed up on the planet, the Roman soldiers and Rome itself did atrocities, again, you cannot imagine at a level that you cannot imagine. And Christians would love them and serve them and Romans would become Christians. And Roman soldiers that committed atrocities would lay down their swords and give it all up to follow Jesus. And that's why you know Jesus as your savior or you have a shot at knowing Jesus because that's how it spread. The darkness is being dispelled Hey, John, how do you know? I know you're an old man, Jesus. How, how do you, or John, I know you're an old man. How do you know Jesus, this is what he meant? This is what he did? This is what he wanted us to do? And John would smile and say, don't forget, I spent three years with him. I saw it all. Spent time with his mama. Go back to our opening little statement. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And some of you would say, yeah, he changed my life. But he also is atoning sacrifice for not only ours, but the whole world and everyone in it. The people you like and I like, and the people I dislike and that I like. And I can't hate people that my Savior died for. That's why we opened up with everybody is someone whom Jesus died for. You mistreat people Jesus died for. You mistreat Jesus. And some of you have been waiting to hear that from Christians for a long time. It's why you haven't decided to step in or lean in. John would quote Jesus in general and say things like this. If it's not best for them, it's a sin. That's why I'm not going to lie to you. 
It's why I'm going to serve you. It's why I'm going to be there for you. It's why I'm not going to cheat on my wife or I'm not going to cheat on my future wife as we just talked about with Meg and her boyfriend. Because if it's not best for him, it's a sin. If it's not best for them, it's a sin. And everyone is a child of God. And it's like Jesus just wanted to take the mystery out of all this. And here's what's beautiful about this love. This whole love ethic we're talking about, it's less complicated than the law. You know there's laws, I mean, one after one another. It's just less complicated. And that's the problem that some people have with the love ethic over, hey, just tell me the Ten Commandments and I'll do the Ten Commandments. And we love the Ten Commandments around here. Just know that. But when you inject love in it, it's far more demanding. Because I, I can do things and mark it off my list, but when I have to love, there's no loopholes, there's no workarounds. There's no word. They're the good people, so I'll love them. They're the bad people, so I won't love them. That is gone. It's why we ask this question all the time around here. And it haunts me because I struggle with this in my own life. That whenever I see people in need, whenever I see people different than me, whenever I'm around people that irritate me and I get irritated all the time, I have to ask the question, what does love require of me? What does love require of me with people that drive me crazy? What does love require of you when it comes to your dad or your mom or the kids at school that don't make your kids real comfortable? When you're not sure what to believe, because sometimes in our faith, we're not sure what to believe. What does love require of me in the way I treat you first? And Jesus drove this whole thing for God so loved the world that he, he, he gave so when it comes to giving to the kids in our community, I have no problem asking you to give big and go farther than you've already gone. So we'll talk about that in a second. When I decide to treat people well, I'm doing well. When you decide to treat people well, you're doing well because you're acting like your savior. Remember last week, if you missed it, you should go watch. It's like when Jesus found that woman in adultery that was caught in adultery and they were gonna kill her. And he stepped in and he said, you're not going to kill her because you have sin too. And everybody dispersed. And here's this woman that was caught in adultery. Don't think about that men too long. She was caught in adultery and he just saved her life. And then he just said, hey, you need to stop sinning now. Do you know the door that opens up when you love someone and then tell them the truth about their lives? It's, a, it's an amazing combination. I'm convinced it's why this church has worked so well. Because y'all love so well. And then we get to talk about what's true. In Jesus' day, one of the greatest offenses is for a child to interrupt an adult. Like, it's just the worst thing a child could do because children were thought as of, you're not even a real human being until you're a certain age. And in public, children would come running by and Jesus would quit talking to adults and let the little kids talk to him and sit on his lap and he'd just hang out with them. As if to say, hey, all you adults, I just need you to just stand there and be quiet because these are the little kids in the kingdom of God. I mean, Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. I mean, how much better of a human being can you be and love better than that? I, I just am always on the Pharisees around here all the time. I love to talk about Jesus, you know, loving the sinners like Matthew and Zacchaeus. But you know what else Jesus loved? He loved the Pharisees. He loved those idiotic, super, I shouldn't call them idiotic. He loved those super religious people that drove everybody nuts because they thought they were better than everybody else. And Jesus would spend time with them. It was just consistent through his whole life, right up to the point that he died for them. And it's why Paul says to Timothy, hey, Timothy, command those who are rich in this present world if you're a follower of Jesus, you're rich in this present world because you have the king of kings as your friend. To do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. My friends, we just got to practice being rich all year long, but especially in this season. Now, last week, I invited you to be super generous. Today, I want to invite you to practice some good deeds. And here's why I want you guys to practice good deeds. And this is if you're online. I would invite you to do this if you're a visitor. I would invite you to do this if you've been at our church for so long and you'd love to say, but Matt, I've done so many things. I need a break. Uh-uh. We don't take breaks. We follow Jesus through our whole lives. 
Just to practice this, we've created a day that's coming up very shortly um, for a plan for 120-ish students. I say that because we're not exactly sure how many we're going to have on November 4th. And if you've heard this already, just bear with me. We're having a shopping day for 4th through 8th graders from the three county schools. And what we're going to do is provide $200 per student. We need to raise a minimum of $25,000. But what I'm really hoping we do is raise $75,000 because we can take these kids shopping and then we can create some funds that throughout the year that kids that show up at school that don't have shoes and socks and hygiene products, the schools that are passionate about what we're doing and they're partnering with us, can make sure throughout the next 365 days, kids have socks and shoes and coats and hygiene products. Now, here's where we jump in today. On this day on November 4th, which is coming up quick, not only are we going to provide the money, we're going to pair these hundred-ish students up with adults from our church. And the beauty of this is kids are going to get a coat, but they get to spend an hour or two with you. We're going to feed them lunch. We're going to bust them to Walmart and Maurice's and Shoe Sensation. And you get the chance to be with them. Not just to be generous with some money, which I hope you're thinking about that, and maybe doubling down, because we need to raise some big time money. But to spend time with a man or woman that loves Jesus. And maybe know that Jesus loves these little kids along the way and that people would see that the church cares about more than just what's going on inside the church. Last year, this happened like it's happened the last couple years. And this crazy thing, some of you took all these kids shopping. You all decide to check out at the same time. So there's people everywhere. There's stuff everywhere. And the Walmart checkout people, I guess that's what they're called. I mean, and, and you know, if you, if you are a checkout person at Walmart, you probably aren't treated well all the time by customers I'm just guessing here's a picture of two of them with my wife Tina because she's always happy and jolly um, the, these two gals and I don't even know their names along with some other Walmart checking out people they started to pull out their own credit cards and they were like we want to get in on the goodness of what is going on here and we want to buy some stuff for some kids and then some other customers at Walmart last year said yeah we'll pay for some stuff too. Isn't that cool? Isn't that amazing? And you know why that happens? Because generosity and love is contagious. That's why John says it's starting to happen. The darkness is being dispelled. But the beauty of it is some of you spent some time with those kids and you got to influence them. And someday, and someday, when those kids are adults and they're wondering, hey, is it worth trying out a church? Is it worth thinking about Jesus? They might remember you. So just to get to the business part of this, because i got to do the business part, um, if you would be willing to participate in this day in a couple weeks, the QR code on the front of your chair is the easiest way for you to do it. If you take out your phone right now, pull up the camera app, it'll take you to a page where you, for, for Be Rich, you can give some money and you can sign up to serve on that day. And you can serve here and serve food and lunch and be hospitality people, but what we really need is people to go, you know what, I'll, I'll shop with a kid, no matter how awkward or weird it is. You can do that right now. If you're online, there's a link. And if you do not know how to use your phone and your daughter or son gave it to you, there's people in the lobby that will help you do that. But it's coming up quick. This is a big deal. Now, last week, I just got to tell you this. Last week, a, a good friend of mine um, decided, last year, a good friend of mine decided to do this. Her name is Courtney. And this is what Courtney wrote. Um, I just need to read this to you. Courtney wrote this to me a couple weeks ago. She said, last year, like everyone else, Tell me if this sounds familiar. My schedule did not need one more activity crammed into it. Courtney's already ahead of some of you because in your mind you've already said, I can't do one more thing and now you just got guilt ridden, didn't you? I know, it's how it works. After seeing for the students that we're just talking about promo last year, I figured what the harm in committing just a few hours, showing up that morning, I was overwhelmed with the excitement, attention to detail, outpouring the love by all that were involved. My student, Nicole, and her life circumstances hit home for me. This is heartbreaking. 
She was dealing with circumstances as a 10-year-old that I struggled with daily as an adult. In other words, a 10-year-old was trying to figure out something that only adults should have to figure out. Nicole and the other students didn't show up that day because they were just in need and the church was giving a handout. No, instead, the vibe of that day was that kids had been specifically chosen, which they, had from, which they are from the school, to have a fun day to get to do a one-on-one -on -one shopping um, trip to get items they needed and wanted and have a meal and know that Lifehouse Church and Christian people love them. Showing up in mass to fill shopping carts with students was incredible. This is, this is a picture of Courtney and her student. We didn't want to show you her face. She didn't that was fair. Just shopping together. Something Courtney probably does with her daughters and her family and her son all the time. But apparently this young gal just hadn't had a lot of opportunities in this direction. Courtney finishes and she says, I realized I had a similar opportunity every week at Lifehouse, the church she has attended for years, to serve not just a once a year event to put on my counter, but an opportunity to help, and this just messed me up when I read it, to fulfill my purpose in this world. And then Courtney marched back to Upstreet, which is our elementary age environment, and she signed up to be an on-stage person to teach kids about Jesus. And she's given her life in Upstreet every week, week in and week out. Now, I tell you that, not, not because I want you to volunteer in Upstreet. You should, but that's not the reason we're doing this. But I get asked the question all the time, I talked about this last week, the question always, does this work? Does this work? And sometimes I'll look at people and go, well, you're a piece of work, so let's start there. Does it fix culture? Are all the kids coming to Jesus? Do they all show up to church? And the answer is no, and I don't know, and sometimes it does. But it works on you, and it works on me, and it changes us when we get outside of us and we start acting like our Savior. And the world is desperate for Christians to start dispelling the darkness like Jesus did. You see, this whole thing is a response to what our Heavenly Father has done for us. That's why we do everything around here that we do. There's no, hey, I'm going to get into heaven because of this, or God will love me more. That's garbage, my friends. We do this because our Heavenly Father sent his son to die on a cross and come back to life and give us life. And our only response should be, that's exactly what we're going to do for other people. So here's what I need you to do today. I, I'm, I'm boldly telling you, this is what I need you to do. If you've not given, all the money's going to the students. None of it's staying here. We're not keeping it for ourselves in any regard. It's all going to kids in our community. I need you to pull out your phone today, and I need you to decide to give. And if you thought what you gave last week was not very much, I need you to reconsider. Give some more. I just do. We're giving the money away. And I need you to think about serving on November 4th. And be part of this. And here's what we hear every time. I didn't want to come or I was nervous to be here. And then I showed up and it was the best day of my year. And I want you to experience that. And I want a student in our community that maybe doesn't trust church people to experience you guys and your love and your joy. And the fact this is a place for everybody. And we'll just be Jesus for a day together. Let's do that. Just a second, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing this song that just matches us so well about the world outside our window. So as you hear it and you sing it, I want you to think about how do I give and how do I serve outside of this place? And let's watch the kingdom of God do what the kingdom of God always does, and it dispels the darkness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for these kids. Thank you for the, the 80 kids or 70 kids that were here over the weekend that are middle schoolers, but thank you for the gob of middle schoolers in our community that just need to be loved also and cared for and time spent and money spent on them. Thank you for a church that does this so well. Help us to have the courage to get out of our comfort zone, to get out of our pointing our fingers at people that are different than us, and engage with them just like you engage with us. Thank you, God, that we get to be a part of something that's strong and it's powerful. And you taught us to do it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing. Let's be generous, give, and serve. Come on, let's go. Spirit 
fills the hearts of life It's an anthem in the making Can you feel it start to rise? Can you hear the generations Getting louder over time? Every son and every daughter Singing out into the night It's not time to be silent Don't you dare From the palace to the streets I can feel that drumbeat pulsing And it's calling you and me I can hear the world awaken Oh, the sound is heavenly Every tribe and every nation Singing Jesus, I believe It's not time to be silent Don't you We'll see you next week.